Hi, Matt. Super excited and humbled to be here as well. I know I just kind of put a call out on Twitter and I do that a lot and uh, just kind of take things as they come. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mumila Kakak. I'm a 26-year-old Inuk woman originally from Baker Lake, Nunavut, now living in Akarit. In October of 2019, I won the Nunavut seat of Member of Parliament. It's the largest electoral district in the world, uh, but it has about the population a little bit bigger than Summerside PEI, uh, not much bigger than uh, Brandon, Ontario. So just to put that into perspective uh, with the amount of individuals that are in the riding compared to the landmass to it. Nunavut is very unique for a number of reasons. It's unique in geography, it's unique in the resources, in current situations in the north, but it's also very unique to the people that live there and to the history of to that Canadian history for that particular part of the country. I'm going to talk a little bit today about how we have these conversations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. I like to have conversations so that we're thinking about how we can do more and do better. I don't think, I, I, for me, the world has been treated as if it's black and white. And as a woman, as an Indigenous individual, as somebody that's living in this weird time in 2020, my whole life has been grey and that's how I've always viewed it. And my mom's Danish and my dad's Inuk. I also have that mixed background. And it's, it's an odd time for an Indigenous person because we're in this transition of trying to find that identity and trying to understand and reclaim what was attempted to be taken away. And that's where that important history aspect comes in for Canada. What the conversation is turning into is Indigenous and non-Indigenous. And the way that we are having these conversations is creating more division instead of more respect and openness in inclusion at high levels. We see... What's the right word? We see individuals of all different backgrounds working together at community levels. We see it and as we get higher and higher, we see more and more of a division in the way that we we think. But I don't think that it needs to be like that. I think that we can still be open to hearing each other's opinions as long as we can be open to having that compromise. It's also turned into a really scary conversation sometimes, especially for white people, because there is this kind of this, again, going back to that black and white, this idea that we you are one or another and you can't somehow simultaneously be two things at once and there's there's all these other factors that come into play the history of canada canadian history is something that is not taught as well as it should be throughout canada in high school i learned about world war 1 or and 2 and i never it never crossed my mind why I wasn't learning my own history, why I wasn't learning about the North, why I wasn't learning about my ancestors. And the federal government has done a excellent, an excellent job at hiding that history, a phenomenal job at keeping systems working to their advantage. But that also means that people continuously stay oppressed, people that need that help, people that are in a vulnerable situation that have these barriers, systemic barriers that make it nearly impossible to get out of. And that's what we see for a lot of Indigenous peoples. That's what we see for a lot of Indigenous groups and majority Indigenous communities across the nations. What we need to understand is how did we get to that point in that particular area? We look at situations across the country, whether it's over fishing rights, whether it's over land rights, animal, water and land rights is 
what we're seeing happening throughout the country. We're also seeing things, though, like inst health institutions. We saw a lady pass away, an Indigenous lady in Quebec. We saw that a few days ago. We see the health institution killing Indigenous peoples. We see the RCMP. We see a lot of our, uh, death by RCMP uh, in Indigenous, majority Indigenous communities. Uh, the numbers of Indigenous peoples are, the negative statistics are, are higher definitely throughout the country. What is starting to happen though is we're beginning to create a scary Again, black and white conversation that things have to be or are pushed to be right or wrong. And we need to figure out how to start compromising. So for the history, uh, I'm going to talk to uh, a little bit more to the north specifically. So uh, I come from... Uh, a place with a small population, but it's also a place where nomadic lifestyle was the lifestyle that our ancestors lived by for thousands of years uh, leading up to that relationship with the federal government, which is a very fresh colonization for Inuit, has been for the most part very quick, very pack-a-punched, and in, in a very short amount of time. I'm 26 years old. Uh, my father's in his early 60s and he was born on the land. So to go from one generation of my father's around that age, uh, depending again on the area and what was going on, on at that point in time, my father was born out on the land, not in a health center or hospital. And to think of in that amount of time, for even just my father going from that lifestyle to what we see now in 2020 with internet, with homes, with being connected to the rest of the world is something that is crazy to think about when you look at it, the amount of change in just one lifetime. Of course, the, the timelines and the periods and what specifics were going on in different Inuit regions varied, but from around the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, up until the 1970s and 80s, we saw some really horrific things. We saw things like the killings of thousands of Inuit sled dogs. We saw Inuit being forcibly relocated from Quebec, northern Quebec, to the high Arctic, like Grease Fjord and Resolute Bay. If you look up John Amagualik, his he is known as the father of Nunavut and his family was taken from northern Quebec and told that they were going to be going to a good place. And when they got there, there wasn't much to live off of in terms of game and, and hunting and many people had died at the time. So there's things like Inuit sled dogs killings happening, forced relocation, Inuit being forcibly taken from communities for TB or tuberculosis treatment, where the CD house ships or Nascopi ships came up. There were things like residential schools and churches, hostels, boarding homes. All of the things that I just named are a type of school that you can relate to residential school, although they're not identified by the federal government like that, which is wrong but that's a whole different other conversation so in this in this point in time 50 60 years ago all of these things were happening inuit spoke inuktitut primarily inuit li lived off the land and lived with the seasons and animals all of these horrific things happen all related to the rcmp and the federal government directly as a reaction to the cold war america came to Canada and saw that the federal government was not taking care of its northerners. And Canada turned around and said, oh, we got to do something about it. And that's where we started seeing forced relocation. They wanted to make sure that they kept the land. They weren't interested in actually caring for the northerners up there. And you can see that in all different kinds of language through the House of Commons with all different kinds of prime ministers. And I think it's really important to point out the fact that the first prime minister, John A. Macdonald, was incredibly, incredibly racist. And I really want people to think about this is the ideation, this is the foundation of which the relationships with the federal government and Indigenous peoples across 
Canada, how they started and how they continue. So in all of that history and, and speaking to all of those horrific things, we also saw good things happen. We saw things, we, we saw the creation of the territory about 20 years ago. We saw the, the amount, and, and again, think of that. Think of that history. Think of how phenomenal that is, that individuals who went from living on the land and speaking a completely different language and having a completely different way of governance, in my opinion, a much better way of governance, but a completely different way of governance, and all of a sudden you have an external force that wants to assimilate you, wants to make sure that your culture is wiped and erased, and you figure out how to fight back against that. You figure out how to claim your own land with an agreement. It was absolutely phenomenal what happened at the time in, in creation of the territory. So that's one positive thing. Another positive thing is Inuit Dabalik Canada Me or the national or ITK. It's the national advocacy organization for Inuit that works with all of Inuit Nungangat, all four Inuit regions. So there has been positive, there has been work that has been done. But again, think about all this because even the positive that I talk about, it's Inuit that have gotten us there. It's Inuit that have helped with that right to self-determination. So an entire group that shares a culture went through mass assimilation and culture genocide in a very short amount of time, in between 50, 70 years-ish, again, looking at the entirety of Canada and all of Inuit Nungangat and where Inuit lived. But to go from that in such a short amount of time to having your life completely disrupted in all different ways, shapes and forms, to go into systems that are so completely oppressive and make it incredibly difficult for you as an individual to determine yourself what you're going to do with your life, to figure out your own opportunity. And now to be in 2020, where you have a 26-year-old face tattooed Inuk woman telling all the white men, what on earth are you guys doing? And <laughs> talk about better, What? why we talk better? Since when is this better? Less, since when is less than basic human rights better? So it's been a, a whirlwind and we have so much catching up to do. But where the federal government, first of all, they, they, they fail in, in lack of basic human rights, first off. But where they ultimately fail and it works, but it works for them. They keep that awareness of that Canadian history. If you don't necessarily want to go around telling other people that the people before you in the same institution had killed thousands of individuals, but it's something that's happened. Have we ever seen justice for residential school or the 60s scoop or for First Nations kids that die waiting for health care for Inuit men who are at a significantly higher times the rate for suicide. When we see these devastating numbers, how can you tell us that this is the best that can be done? Where we see crime and abuse and violence is often where we see struggle. It's where we see poverty. If people are fighting for basic rights, if people are struggling to find a safe place to sleep at night, if people can't feed themselves, if a five-year-old is going to school every day on an empty stomach, how can you expect us to grow and have that self-determination, have that equal opportunity, when the rate of living for Inuit men and women to a certain age is lower than the rest of Canada. For children is much lower. Suicide rates, death, whether that's suicide or murder, are at such a higher rate. It's <laughs> we're, We are so isolated and it is very easy to sweep things under the rug because there are, there are millions of other people in the country. But that lack of basic essentials 
results in violence, results in things that are much bigger. We look at residential schools. When you have thousands of children not being taught how to love or how to take responsibility and accountability in a healthy way, that from the age of seven to 15 doesn't know what it feels like to have a hug, how can we have those skills transfer on to the next generations? And this is where we see intergenerational trauma. So all of these layers, and it can get really complex and it can get really messy. But what we are turning it into is a conversation of what your blood quantum is and whether or not you are indigenous enough. That's a conversation that's happening. At the same time, we are saying that there was one right and one wrong. So there must be a right for Indigenous peoples or not. It must be a, we all get a piece of the pie or none of us at all, which I don't believe to be true. But, but, but the way that we have these conversations create more division because we're not seeing each other as individuals with different ideations we're seeing each other as individuals that are either right or wrong and social media completely fuels that i highly recommend the social dilemma on netflix for anyone that's interested in thinking about things on a different level social media has some of the biggest impacts in all parts of our lives at, at this point, really, uh, in, in all different kinds of ways. And that's a whole different conversation. Um, and so to talk about a, a Canadian history, a short history, and to be at the point where I am, it's, it's all great and we're making progress, sure. But <laughs> I was also raised in a community that has one of the higher rates of suicide, has one of some of the those more intense statistics. And it looks like we we may be making progress from the outside, especially when the federal government gives you those numbers of we're doing better and we're doing more. But when you live in it every day and when you're raised there, when that's your home, when that's your family and you can't find a home to purchase, you can't find childcare spaces to put your children in daycare. It's extremely high cost of living. Transportation costs a lot. It The southern communities, southern cities look very, very appealing because everything is much more accessible. But it removes us from our home. It removes us from comfort. It removes us from from family, from culture, from tradition, and puts us into a totally different type of lifestyle. So my message is we want to be able to access opportunity and have the right to self-determination on our homelands, where we were anyways, before contact with the federal government, pre-contact with RCMP. And I think that it's extremely important to note the different histories for Indigenous groups are very distinct. And even within our own groups, we can be very distinct as well, because Inuit live across Canada, but Inuit also live in Alaska, in Russia, in other countries across the circumpolar countries. And that the history with the colonizer in each place is all different. And that histories last longer and shorter and some were pack a punched in, in different ways. But also to understand that I do not speak on behalf of anyone. I represent my constituency and I push for what they would like to see me push for. And that's what I've been, have been doing, but I don't speak on behalf of 
Inuit. I don't speak on behalf of indigenous peoples. So many meetings I go to where they kind of look at me like, okay, give us the 10 step program to how to achieve reconciliation and we can check off that box. And in reality, that's not how it works. Uh, and what I try and explain to people is try and look at it like this. We are both human. We both have our own experience, but our families, our people have our own histories as well. When I, when an indigenous person is asking you where you're from, Typically, we're trying to gauge if you understand where your place is or where you think your place is. I'm way more comfortable if a person says, oh, I'm a second generation Canadian from Scotland uh, than saying, oh, my name is Tom from whatever, Toronto, because that helps me understand that you understand your family has been here for two generations. You have an understanding of what's going on in the country around you. You have an understanding of history, of diversity. And you might be more keen to be open to talking to me about these kinds of things. So to me, it's it's all in how we talk. And it's all in how we decide to be open. And there's a point in time, of course, for everything, and we're going to make mistakes, and that's perfectly fine. But I think that the most important thing is to treat people like human and to understand that everybody has an experience. Everybody is the way they is for a reason. And I forget that sometimes 100% on the hill, and it's something I'm constantly checking in on, and critical reflection is another good one um it's really important to check in with yourself and to constant life learning and growing never stops unless you let it and you can be constantly doing more and trying to do better and that's 100 percent in your control and totally up to you so i'm excited for all the questions and conversations and I know I've been talking for a little bit now so Matt if we could do some questions that would be great absolutely thank you so much for that I thought that was beautiful I could have listened all day um, thank you um I think I think like one of the, the first things that comes to mind is uh, I think a lot of people would agree that yeah we've kind of broken down in terms of our communication and respecting um the other side has a history and we're not going to convert them by yelling at them and screaming at them um, is there anything that you've done in your approach that you found to be uh, most effective as kind of like a practical tactic to bring that vision to reality where we're kind of respecting the other side, but letting them understand our position too? I think in in terms of, of course, it always depends on where I am, and I'm going to speak directly to working on the Hill. I am very much a... If something makes me uncomfortable, I say it. And you can see all the white people get physically uncomfortable too. And I say good because my whole life has been altered by white people decisions that sometimes have no concept or they don't frankly don't care what those consequences result in. And I have in in a sense more of a right to be there because of that history, because of what my ancestors been through. That place should be filled with racialized individuals, with people of color who want to talk about diversity and inclusion in Canada. Oftentimes that is not white, but who is making all the decisions? And I've had some really, really great conversations with my white colleagues I remember, um, I so on the hill, you have security there, and security, of course, is to make sure that everybody is safe and everybody is okay. But also, a part of their job is to m memorize all of our faces as members of parliament, so that we can just come and go from our office and we're not getting stopped all the time. I get stopped constantly, of course. People like this don't walk around on the hill or right into Jagmeet's office <laughs> and um, I had another uh, 
a female colleague who had just gotten stopped and was kind of uh, heated at the time. And I had a girl, a uh, Randall Garrison, a bald white man, and he comes up like we're in this conversation, and he goes, "Mommy, lock, have you gotten stopped?" And I said, "Yeah, of course, all the time." And he said, "Not me. I've been in here what ten plus years or whatever with my bald white head and." I look like I'm supposed to be here. They have never stopped me ever. And we had a whole conversation about that. But he understands that. He understands that the way he walks through the world and what that experience looks like for him is completely different from mine simply because of how we look. And he gets that. And he gets that, you know, then we can have conversations about, well, you know, what happens in a situation where if I do get stopped by security, it's extremely helpful if I have the white bald guy coming over saying, oh, no, 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 it's fine. She's one of my colleagues. That's where allies are are extremely helpful. So I think that the conversation, you know, and, and in terms of different positions and different environments, of course, everything is going to be it's going to be different depending on the circumstances. And for you know, a member of parliament to try and access services, I can do that. But if somebody is trying to access something that might not be able to throw around that title, it can be incredibly difficult. So I think even all the different levels of privilege in privilege are really interesting too because we talk about and privilege is not good or bad it, it's it's it can be either or depending on how you use it it's all in how you use it I have white privilege 100% my mom's white and I've gotten to be able to see how to work that white privilege even though I don't look white so it's it's really interesting kind of the tips and tricks that you learn uh, coming from a mixed background as I do, struggling with that identity. But the amount of clarity I think that comes along in life when you start to understand that people are the way that they are for a reason. It's, I think at the end of the day, what it comes down to is we're all human and we should all be working to supporting and, and being supportive of one another. But if we're not sitting, willing to sit and listen, then what's the point? Yeah. There's, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I, I wondered, it just it does connect with one of the questions that came up, so I'll, I'll drop this if I may. Um, hi, Mumilak. Thank you for the great talk. Could you talk a little bit what it's like working in Parliament as a young Inuit woman, which you've just done? Has it been welcoming or forbidding? Um, awesome. Thank you for that. I just had to write it down because usually about halfway through, I start rambling on a completely different topic. But um, I have a lot of pep talks with myself. I'm definitely a lot more comfortable now, but back in November, definitely, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to phrase that, but I'll just say it like it is. I didn't know what I was doing. And a lot of the time, you know, I just looked at my colleagues and I'd kind of copy what they were doing. And I sat, I sit next to Rachel Blaney our whip and I just do what the whip says that's my my one my number one rule I hope she doesn't get mad about me saying that publicly um my number one rule in my job is don't get the whip mad and the whip's uh role in any party is that policy and procedure aspect so when there's voting we hear from the whip's office when there's <clears throat> an issue in the house of commons and that's why that's my rule because we follow the House of Commons rules and who determines that and works around that are the WHIPS offices with each of the parties. Um, so it's it's super interesting. So I sit next to Rachel Blaney and 
for the first little while, especially, I would just copy what she does. And anytime I had any questions, I would just ask her. In the North, we're not as, in to an extent, we're not as politics savvy or engaged or interested as the South sometimes. Um, so it was a very, very um, big learning experience. Um, but with security stopping me all the time it was very much especially after Christmas because we all went away for a little while and then we all came back and uh, we were back in the house again and security was stopping me like left right and center and that's how it felt anyways and a lot of the time I'd take the elevator because I'd know everybody took this takes the stairs <clears throat> And I know I'd be alone. So that's where I'd have my little pep talks. And I'd say to myself, I belong here. I belong here. I belong here. But what was the most helpful was to actually stand in the house, was to actually go on committee and just say how I'm feeling. Uh, I remember watching an uh, interaction between Carolyn Bennett and Lenore Zane, Zan. And they were talking about racism. They were talking about MMIWG. And how uncomfortable that was as an Enoch woman to watch two white ladies who will never, never, if you look white, you will not, you will not experience racism to the extent that someone that is racialized will ever. And that's just simply on how you look. And again, that's not a bad thing. It's just simply how it how it is. But when individuals start having discussions as if to understand what it must be like to even to to, to as an Inuk woman, as an indigenous woman, how scary it is to travel a alone. I try my best to never travel alone if I can help it. The irony, I've just traveled uh, by myself in my writing. I should m make this clear. Outside of my writing in southern Canada, I do my best to never be alone. To understand that my white mother has said to me, you... I don't care what you're doing and where you're going and who you're with. If you're in danger, you call me. I don't care. Because if you go missing, I know it's me and your dad. <clears throat> it's our family looking for you. I don't know who's going to look for you because of how you look, because you're brown. My white mom has had that conversation with me. So... And, and that's the reality, though. That's the reality of my experience. And being a politician is not something I set out to do. It is not some... If, if you asked me 54, 56 weeks ago, I would have laughed and said, you're crazy. There's no way I would ever do that. And here I am now. But the first few weeks of... We were being sworn in, so my parents were here in Ottawa. And... Um, we were walking down the road. We were going to go get pizza. And um, <clears throat> we were walking from their hotel. And this guy's yelling really racist slurs at me. And my mom doesn't really know what's going on at the time. I get what's going on. And so we're walking down the road. And there's me, my mother, and, and my father. And I'm closest to the guy yelling. But I figured... Maybe he has mental illness. Maybe there's other things going on. Whatever. He didn't seem physically threatening to me. So I just kind of left it alone. And we get to the restaurant and my mom was like, what just, she was kind of puzzled. What just happened there? And I said, I'm pretty sure that was at me. My father's a little bit older and hard of hearing. And it just kind of went over his head. <laughs> um, but that's the reality. I understand that as as an Indigenous woman, as a 26-year-old woman, that even what my life looks like in this current position off of the hill is something that I don't think many people think of. People don't think about the experiences that Inuit women have experienced, the history of Indigenous peoples across the country. And when we look at missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls... First off, this liberal government has delayed their response and calls to action for it. But 
when you look at it over the last 10 years and look at the numbers, it would be as if 500 women from Ottawa area had gone missing in the last 10 or so years. That would There would be complete outrage before it even got to that point. So why do we let it be okay to lose indigenous life unnecessarily and see here's that's why i wrote my stuff down because i'm going off into a different topic but all of this in mind because all of this is valid because it's experience that relates to me is that when i'm in the house of commons i'm on committee with zan and bennett for example i say it's incredibly difficult and quite frankly, uncomfortable to watch two non-Indigenous women have this conversation. And I just say it like that. I stand in the House of Commons and I say, it's incredibly hard to stand here in an institution that was meant to kill me. And I just say it like that. And watch that uncomfortable be trans, watch the room get physically uncomfortable but in a good way. I think that you can't grow or learn if you're not experiencing a little bit of discomfort. So I think it's moments like that that just really help the entirety of the chambers really realize that their their decisions impact human life. And I think we forget that sometimes in that room. And we get a little bit nitpicky and, and partisan. And I think that that's always going to be there. And I think we just need to work on, on doing it in a better way where decisions are made to include more people and are made quicker so that people are getting the assistance when they need it. Yeah, that was excellent. Thank you. And I want to apologize. I'm not speaking uh, or clapping or anything like that. Uh, just let way your audio is clear. But uh, these are amazing stories. Thank you so much for sharing. I think I had to like mute myself a few times. Um, so the next question we have comes, um, how do we frame the contradictions when resource extraction companies go into communities and offer real material changes to the inhabitants? Uh, does that one, does that one make sense? I think I understand. Okay. You're sorry. I'm messaging uh, my partner these yeah. questions and uh, he's just kind of like, what are you telling me? And I'm like, I need notes. Um, I should have grabbed my notebook. Absolutely. I love to talk about natural resource extraction. And that's exactly what we are seeing in the South is what is going to start and what has already started in the North. When we look at what is going on in wet sweat and I don't have a side I would take because I don't understand all of the sides. So from what I understand though, there's multiple groups. It's not a simple clear, uh, and, and, and this is where again, things start to get messy because we like that black and white. We don't like, it's, it's easier to pick two out of two options, a yes or no, instead of trying to compromise and figure out the middle ground. But when we look at what's wet and we're talking about, again, the history, what has happened in that area, what has happened in, in policy and procedure of the Indian Act in that area, what kind of treaty agreements have been made, in what points in time, what kinds of wording was used, who was a part of those negotiations, all of these questions I would ask before making any kind of assumption or decision on anything. When we look at what's wet and though, what we're talking about are multiple groups with multiple, not choices, multiple wants, all wanting a different outcome though. So instead of, and, and, and this is where the federal government is failing and fueling racist ideation, conversation, and action, quite frankly. This is where the federal government completely fuels that. Wet Sweaten has been asking for the prime minister for months, for months and months. And as far as I know, he's never gone out. And refusing to even be a part of that, to me, shows that lack of respect in the most important relationship in Canada 
for the record. Oh my gosh. You should see me yelling at the House of Commons sometimes on virtual. It's it's quite fun. Um, so sorry, back to natural resource extraction. I think that, and when, when you look at it, and I think it's so important to know all the information, at least in Nunavut, where we are starting to see natural resource extraction is where we are starting to see, is where we often see migration or breeding grounds for our animals and I believe that our animals do that on purpose because they know that we should leave that in the earth whole nother conversation though I think that natural resource extraction is something we need to 100% do a 180 and turn around and walk the other way I think we need to look at cleaner initiatives greener initiatives but that means significant investment that means putting in that ultra wealth tax that means closing those tax haven loopholes that means making sure and it can be done the trillions of dollars that would come back into the canadian economy if the liberals stopped propping up their rich friends my goodness and that's what absolutely boggles my mind is we are the party that is here to help people and it's incredibly frustrating that people don't see that <laughs> because that's what happens at, at, in the house the liberals are interested in helping their rich friends cons are the same way and everybody's interested in their power and money and we want to help people need help and that's the important thing i think that Going back to what I was talking about at the beginning, it's that how we have conversation, how we create dialogue, how we, there must be able to be a compromise reached when it comes to natural resource extraction. And it's going back to that, it's not black and white. What's the gray? Let's figure out the middle ground. Let's figure out the, the gray. Let's have respectful conversation. And it's something that needs to happen or we're going to continue to see things like wet sweat and um, even Mi'kmaq territory. I know that's a little bit of a different thing because it's fishing rights, but it's still land, animal, water rights. It's going to be more and more and more of a conversation and we need to figure out how to do it in a good way or it's going to be a gong show. Is, is there any international uh, efforts or movements or things that are happening in other countries that you've seen that you felt particularly inspired by and you think Canada should be doing this specifically? Absolutely. I think that the New Zealand, I think that New Zealand has been doing a phenomenal job in terms of cultural revitalization and giving the Maori the means to actually do that, giving them the funding and materials and resources to actually be able to do that that's what's key because it's one thing to say okay you can go and figure stuff out on your own but when you when i a third of my constituents live in an overcrowded and or mold ridden home how can you expect people to thrive and strive as we all should when we don't even give them the means to make it to the age of 20 it's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, New Zealand, I would love to learn more of that and how that has looked and worked out and the history of that. Um, and in particular, Greenland. Um, on a personal note, because my mom is Danish and Inuk and Denmark colonized Greenland, um, the irony of, of things, but that for that on a personal level, but in and also on a personal level, but in relation to work as well, uh, that when in that what that history looks like of Denmark colonizing Greenland and the similarities to Canada, but the differences in what it's looked like from there, um, there has been a lot more it seems anyways, a lot more independence, a lot more of right to self-determination, a lot more of determining how the economy is run within that country, all of these different kinds of things uh, that give Inuit 
in Greenland a lot more room to control what happens in their life, in their community. So uh, I've been in touch actually with the Danish embassy and um, just looking for a contact or a few in Greenland and eventually uh, get over there, hopefully after all this COVID stuff. But there's 100% some really, really cool stuff going on uh, across the world. And I think that Canada likes to think we don't need help and we do such a good job at everything. But in terms of indigenous relation, we are horrible. And I think that Canada needs to start looking at best practices from other countries. 100%. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. We are getting towards uh, the final comment. So for those who have watched and been excited by your, your words and your passion, uh, what should we do next? What are your final thoughts on next steps? Yes. So there's tons of things happening for me right now. Um, as the lone representative for the territory, I am always, always crazy busy. But you can definitely help me by, number one, what I'm looking at doing at right now is spreading awareness, helping educate other Canadians. Nunavut, Inuit, we have been saying this at least since I was born, and I'm 26 years old, and the Canadian government, the federal government, continues to ignore us. We need to have supporters and other people upset alongside what's happening in the territory. Right? You can help by reposting or retweeting, uh, finding me on social media under Mumilak or Mumilak Kup. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I also have a podcast um, segments or moments with Mumilak segments that I do every Sunday where I have an Indigenous guest come on and I talk about all different kinds of experiences. I've interviewed people like Elizabeth Isaac, Cody Coyote, Cindy Blackstock, uh, and amongst uh, a number of other wonderful individuals from across the country. Uh, you can find that uh, again online. It's every Sunday at seven o'clock or you can find me on Spotify and on on iTunes. Um, and of course, you can always just Google search me and find my office contact information where there's my office email or phone number. I'm very interested in doing any kind of podcasts or interviews, anything that helps spread the message. And you can help me by spreading the message. And that's my big focus right now. If you want to kick it up a notch, though, you could email and or call Carolyn Bennett is a minister, uh, Minister Dan Vandell. Minister Mark Miller or the Prime Minister himself and that all helps if we are not collectively using our voice the federal government gets to continue to ignore Inuit and the needs of people in the territory and yeah I'm super excited the next uh, little while is going to be continuing more travel I'm going to another four communities here in the upcoming weeks and yeah it's been Super exciting and super fun, to be quite honest. Very fun. <laughs> Beautiful. That's all we can hope for in 2020. Just a little bit of fun. <laughs> That's good to mm -hmm. hear. Um, well, we like, thank you so much for your time. We're uh, very honored to have uh, spent this uh, period with you. <laughs> thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. Okay, cool. Um, awesome. So we'll uh, disconnect here and, uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your weekend. You too. Thanks. Awesome. Okay, so uh, that is number two, Movie Like uh, That was really exciting and inspiring, and she's just an, just an incredible person with beautiful energy. Um, I think that that comment is a really important one, and it's kind of a trend that um, we've seen with people that are going to be coming in to present, talking about how we've kind of lost the ability to disagree with each other. Uh, it goes straight to an insult. There is black or white. 